I'm TJ Agresti, the Director of Communications for Denver Air Connection and Key Lime Air. And I took the opportunity to talk with Chad Smith, one of the most senior pilots flying for Key Lime Air and Denver Air Connection. Chad provided an in-depth peek behind the curtains of operations and the culture of the company, his flying experiences, both good and bad, and what Key Lime Air and Denver Air Connection means to a community like Alliance. Enjoy this first blog and stay tuned for more covering the news and people of Denver Air Connection, Key Lime Air, and the aviation industry in general. Hey, Chad, how you doing? Good, man. You've been a pilot with Key Lime and Denver Air Connection for how long now? Um, 16 and a half years. I was hired in January of 2003. So you started with how many hours? Um, I actually started with around... 800 or so, and I built up some time as a first officer in the Metroliner, and then was flight instructing on the side, building up hours as well, heavily during the weekend. Mm -hmm. And then, and you maybe heard early on, Wade and I have known each other since the day I stood for our our flying in 2001. Wade and I knew each other really, really well. And he actually gave me my first commercial flying job, flying a radio traffic uh, traffic reporter in the back of a 172. Oh, wow. (laughs) So that was my first job with Wade, because that was Wade's deal, is he owned a 172 and we put a guy named Jonathan Steele, who was KSOI 101.1 in Denver. His, he was the traffic reporter for that radio station. I used to fly him around. We had wow. several other pilots that did that, but I also did that as well. So I built time that way as well. But in 2003, that's kind of where I started. I got some SIC time, built up enough time between that and also flight instructing to eventually get to part 135 minutes, you know, 1,200 or so hours, mm-hmm. and started in the Cessna 404 in April of 2003 as a PIC, a captain in a 404, 400 series Cessna, called sure. a Titan. Yeah. Um, that's how I started. And believe it or not, I actually started flying to Scotts Bluff my very first flight. My very first route was Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So I was already in- involved in this Western Nebraska community going all the way back to 2003. Um, at that point, did a lot of the things, moved. Believe it or not, I, you know, I had a, without getting personal, I had a marriage fail at the end of 2003 and um, took a leave of absence. And I remember Cliff. You want to hear a funny story? Okay, so this stuff's going to put out there because Cliff would, who would deny it. But <laughs> Cliff, when I went up to him in like around October of 2003 and said, hey, you know, my marriage is failing and I feel like I just need to take a leave of absence to go fly or to go, you know, just go home. I'll still probably flight instruct, but I, you know, I just want to take a leave of absence. I'll come back. And he goes, love this. Your career is forever. Marriages are temporary. So, <laughs> well, I can't imagine Cliff no, saying Cliff would that. never say that, right? <laughs> so I was appalled when he said that. Um, and at that point, we started laughing. But he says, well, go do your thing, and we'll welcome you back. So basically, in 04, right around the latter part of January, I started back up. Flew the 4 for a few months. And in April of 2004, I was tied to the Metroliner as a PIC. So at that time, 2004, Key Lime had <clears throat> the 404s. Two Metro mm-hmm. liners. We had more than that. Um, in really, in 2003 was our big growth year. S- uh, summertime of 2003 was a big, big year that we really kind of bet the farm and brought in, I think, five more metros. But I think when I first hired in 03, we had one 404. We eventually bought two. We had, I think, four or five Navajos. And I think I had four or five metros. By the end of 2003, in the summertime, we had, I think, picked up four to five more metros because UPS wanted us to take over more of the ramp right. at DIA. And so there were other contractors out there that we just kind of, they just weeded them out and we just took over more of the routes. So that was our big growth year was 03. We also had another one, but 03 was a big year where we just hit it hard and we, you know, we kind of bet the farm. I, I know Cliff and Glenn put a lot of money, their own money, houses online to try to make this work, to try to put the money out there to buy these aircraft. So, but yeah, it, it almost doubled, I think, within that first six months from 03 to, you know, latter part of 03. So as yeah. you developed your flying skills in the Metro and built your time, you know, the normal career path would be build time and start looking for a job someplace mm-hmm. else, but you stayed. I did. Um, believe it or not, when I was first offered the opportunity to go to the Metroliner in 04, Great Lakes also had offered me a job as well. Mm-hmm. And that was where everybody went. All my buddies went to Great Lakes and eventually moved on to Frontier. And that was kind of the normal a career path, and I think it was just normal for everybody to do that. And I. I just kept thinking, you know, I don't want to be an SIC. I really like flying. I love flying the Metro. I still love flying the Metro. I've been flying it forever. You know, we're you know, 16, you know, 15 some odd years than flying the Metro. I love flying the Metro, but I just love kind of doing it by myself. Single pilot. It just was kind of my thing. You know, it was a, it was, I always thought it was therapy. I didn't have to pay for mm-hmm. um, Flying to me was therapy, but I didn't have to pay $9 an hour to go to therapy. 
So I just never, I never really left. I mean, I'll admit I've had a couple of different interview experiences to leave the company. Didn't get hired. I did interview at Frontier at one time. I did interview at, at, um, at Kalita. But you know what? I, I only did it more just to kind of see if there was a there was an interest in me. But at the same time, to me, Cliff and I have always had a really good relationship, and um, it was like family to me here, and still like family to me here. Um, but yes, I think a lot of guys moved on, a lot of guys left, and I just loved it. When I finally moved up here, at home met my new wife, Donna, and we moved up here. She'd already been up here, but I moved up here in, I think, right around 05, 06. At that point, I was really happy, and I was just flying home every day, flying home every day. And I think it was just momentum that just kept me just doing this because I was home every day, getting paid a decent wage, and, and still flying the Metro and still having a ball. So It's hard to replace what you're describing from a lifestyle perspective, mm -hmm. joy of flying perspective. Mm -hmm. um, my experience in just over a year here with the – pilots especially, pilots that stay understand the lifestyle that we have. Yeah, they do. That Cliff and Glenn do whatever they can to take care of us and give us a balance and give us life. We they fly do. as much as we want, right. when we want, yep. and often where we want. Yep. No other airline that I've ever heard of mm -hmm. does that. Not at all. And they'll bend over, you know, they've always bent over for me. And I, and I know that Cliff was excited about getting this for me. Mm -hmm. He's like, I can get you home a little more. You can do it as much or as little as you desire. If it gets you home a little bit, that's okay. And I, and I thought that was, uh, that was really um, a big deal for me. It wasn't necessary because ha I'm happy doing what I'm doing. But if I get home maybe one extra night a week, that's a good thing. you know. Um, but to have him say, hey, this is your baby now, and you can have fun with it. You can play with this toy if you want to. Or you can leave it alone, whatever you want to do. And that's, yeah, that's offering a lot to me that I didn't expect. Yeah. I don't know if um, you remember, I've read it recently, but we have a pilot's creed. Mm -hmm. And I developed that with all the senior pilots' input. Mm -hmm. I know you had made some comments on it, and Dan Taylor, mm -hmm. Nels Peterson, Jonathan mm -hmm. Thorne, um, all of the pilots that I respect, I don't want to say most, but I just respect the knowledge base that you have sure. and are so willing to share with us as new pilots coming into this company. Right. Um, like you, I kind of felt like I found a home here and a family, yep. and for the first time ever, I felt like I belong someplace. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's only because of the senior pilots and that whole notion of, look, if you want to be a pilot here, this is how we fly. Right. We, f we fly by hand. Yep, we do. And we fly very precisely, we and we call each other out yep. when we're not flying precisely. Yep. Um, even uh, last night coming in, Cliff uh, had a less than subtle landing, and the first thing he did, because Seth and I were right behind him, he looked right back and he said, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he knew right away. We, we hold ourselves to a very high standard, and then I think you have to as an aviator. I think you're always learning, you're always growing, and you're always trying to be better. I had an interesting conversation with Reese not that long ago, and Reese says, I'm tired of flying the Grand Junction run every day. And I said, but think about this, Reese. I flew, I, you know, I've flown the Alliance run now for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Could be considered very, very boring, but you know how I kept myself sharp? I tried to do it better every day. Yeah. It's the same route, it's the same thing. It may be mundane, but if I have a bad landing in the morning, I'm gonna make that better landing in the afternoon and the evening. And that's the way it always was for me, is I can always do it better. And I was always looking for the perfect flight. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect flight, departure, you know, takeoff, departure, level off, arrival, landing. It had to be perfect. And I haven't gotten one yet. Yep. We're also looking for the perfect flight. It's not, it's, it's probably out there, but we may never get it. But we're always striving for the perfect flight. The pilots that are real key line pilots have that same yep. outlook. And yep. it's a joy to fly with them. And you fly multiple routes with somebody, and it's, it's a game. Yep. And it's it is a, a game. really competitive game here. It's super competitive. Who can outdo each other? Who can <laughs> grease it on time after time? And it's not easy in the planes we fly, no, right? No, it's not. And when you're in, yeah, for anybody that has, you know, your multiple types, I mean, you know, this morning I got a landing that I wasn't very pleased with in Scotts Bluff. I did it better here in Alliance. Um, you're always working to, to be better. And that's, that's my biggest focus. And that's how I keep myself sharp, is I know I can do better the next day. Always can do it better the next day. Yeah. Before Key Lime, uh, you said you had about 900 hours. Were you? Yeah. Are you from Nebraska originally? I'm actually not. I'm from. I was born and raised in Denver. 
Yep, born and raised in Denver. I actually learned to fly, believe it or not, right next door to Aspen at Aspen Flying Club. That's, that's where I learned to fly. That's where I learned to fly. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. So, I mean, that was, when, when did you learn? I mean, what, what year did you learn to fly? So I started in 97 and then paused and then picked up again in, I think, 2002 it was. Okay, Melinda so Higgle was my primary. I knew Melinda. I was a flight instructor there. Larry Ramsdale was the owner. So I knew Larry pretty well. Yeah. Um, there was a story at Aspen about a pilot who, the day after he got his private, lost an engine just north of Cheyenne and did an emergency into Cheyenne. You remember that? Vaguely. Vaguely. You know who that pilot was? No. That was me. That was you. You're kidding me. No. And Melinda. So I landed uh, um, just on the end of the, end of the runway. Emergency services comes out. This is the other part of the story I didn't tell you. <laughs> My hands are still on the oh, locked up, yeah. locked up. Mm -hmm. and I am fixated straight ahead. And I, right now, I can't even remember what I was thinking, other than am I actually alive? Right. And emergency services started to approach the plane, and then paused and looked, caught my attention, went like this, and then opened the door. And I still had my hands, and he just gently oh, put his hand on mine. <laughs> And then they drove me to the terminal in Cheyenne, put me in the bar, bought me a shot and a beer, <laughs> and said, you're going to be fine. And then uh, Melinda calls and says, where are you? Because she's at the airport. She'd sure. flown up in a 172 um, with another pilot to come and get me and bring me back to Centennial immediately. And she comes to the bar and she says, don't finish drinking that because you're going to go flying with me tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. I met with her at 6 a.m. and I said, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I, I was sweating bullets just mm -hmm. starting the plane. Mm -hmm. But she got me in the plane. The, ne the next day, the same, exactly the same thing, same routine. And by the third day, a little uh, abnormal recovery, you know, a little stall work, and kind of it broke the ice and I right. started to feel like I could fly again. So it wasn't for her in Aspen. And I wouldn't be here with you right now. That's no cool. way. No, you wouldn't be here. That's true. Great flight instructors. That's what they're all about. I mean, they're there to take care of us, and they become great friends. I mean, I still have great friends who are my flight instructors, and I, they 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 become lifelong friends for you. That's the relationship you develop. It's better than. It's, it's more emotionally connected than any golfing instructor you'll ever have, yeah. right? You know what I'm saying? You can be taught by a great golf pro, but you know what? Your life depends your, your on, life depends that on person this person to get you it. through this. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Cool. And I yeah. found the same thing here with Glenn and Cliff. They, yeah. they take the time to develop every single True. pilot here. True. And it's not even you know, a little push. No. It, it's, they're going to get you to the point where you are not only competent, but you're an excellent pilot. Correct. You do Correct. the same thing. I hear it all the time. You pass on tribal knowledge. You try and help try whoever to. you can. Mm -hmm. Is that part of who we are, don't you think? That's definitely think it's our culture. I think it, and it does, it is passed on by Cliff and Glenn. And I mean, Cliff was the one that kind of got me. He was the one that did, you know, check ride in the 404 when I first got here. And so that's who I knew. He taught me to be a check airman in the 404. And that's what kind of got me through that. Glenn, when I got in the jet, he was the one that took me for the first 100 hours and said, we're going to get you through this. I'm going to be your captain. You're going to be my FO, and I'm going to teach you how to do this. They're going to reverse roles, and we're going to teach you how to be a captain. And so they, they do take the time and the effort to sit down and say, we can make you better. You're good. We can make you better. You know, we're going to make you that much tighter. And you're, we, want you to, we want you to then pass that on to somebody else. And that's the challenge that we all have, as particularly as a 135 captain and not a 121 captain, is we get these 250-hour guys that you've got to basically begin to teach them how to be what you want them to be. Right. It's the same pass on of the baton that Glenn gave to me that i got to pass on to somebody else and say, no, this is the way we do this. This is what Glenn expects you to do this. This is how I expect you to do this. This is the way we phrase it. This is the call out. This is how we challenge the response. And you got to work these guys up to that level. And you keep pushing them and pushing them and pushing them until you know they're right, right? That's what we do. It's interesting because when I worked with uh, Christine and HR to build the recruiting program, yeah. we came up with the saying, it's your career or your career path. Mm -hmm. And the career Good path point. was a nod to the reality that not everyone's going to stay. It's sure. just, it's a fact of life. Correct. We know that. But... If you understand what's available here and you spend a few years at Keyline, just like you would at any other regional, mm -hmm. you will be so well prepared. You will yep. be the best in your class. And mm -hmm. I have now spoken to the head recruiters of Frontier, United, American, Omni, Atlas, 
every key line person they get sails through. Mm -hmm. They don't have any problems, not in systems, not in the sim, not on their check ride, not on IOE. Good point. They're the pride and joy of their class. Right. Who else can offer that? Who else, Nobody. if you're a pilot out there considering coming here, where are you gonna get that level of training, that level of support? You're not going to. Yeah, you're, not just, going to. you're just not yeah. going to. Yeah. We make we make the best. That's what we work for. We want you to be the best. Because we know it's not only is it's your life, but we got nine or 30 or eventually 50 yeah. or more behind you relying on your ability to take care of this flight, regardless of what it takes. Fly the airplane, get the people there safely. And I think I've even had to ask myself more recently is like, you know, what is my motivation? Because, you know, I've got a lot of flight hours, been doing this a long time, been here at this company a long time. And sometimes you need that. What's that edge? What's the edge I need? And it's about the passengers. It's about taking care of the customers. That's what it's all about around here is just taking care of those customers. I know that's what Cliff and Glenn feel. And that's exactly the way I feel is taking care of those passengers on every single flight, making them glad that they're there. I think we just work hard to do that. That's ultimately why we beat ourselves up on yes. the landings, because that's all the customer that's ever remembers feel. about their entire flight. Exactly. They don't think about, hey, I just got a nope. premium snack or boy these seats are comfortable or that flight attendant was really nice or the pilots actually called me by my first name right if you bought the landing that uh, uh, tj it's all out the window blew that one <laughs> that's it it's all out the window. i hear it exactly. every time it, it is true judging you on your landings that's and we it. we we focus on that and i think that's what it's funny because when i fly with fo's that i have flown with before guys that have been around a while say, man, you balloon, you never balloon. Or, hey, how, how'd you make, you never make a mistake, you know? Well, that's my goal is to always grease that thing in. I mean, we all, our goal is always to grease it in. We don't always grease it in, but that's a goal to grease it in every day. You, know? you mentioned uh, potential 50 seat. You know, we just took mm -hmm. delivery of our, our first Embraer 145 yep. Yep. this week. Um, you've been here 16 years, and you've seen the trajectory from uh, 404 through the Metroliner, through the Dornier jet, and now the Embraer 145. Has that trajectory just been smooth or has it been a fight? Oh, I think we all fight. I think the company fights to, 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 I think Cliff's always had the vision. And I think the people have to catch the vision, right? We're all trying to catch the vision. And um, I've said it numerous times, if Cliff can dream it, it will happen. I believe that. I wouldn't bet against the guy on any poker game in the world. Yeah, because he'll bet. He'll bet it. He just wills his way. Yeah, he does. He just muscles and his way us. through everything, and, and but he pulls us along with it. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think that could I have imagined this? No, but when I first hired on, I saw the first renderings on a piece of paper for Denver Air Connection that did not did not exist. I saw that logo many many years ago, that Wade had put together with a graphic artist. Did I know what it even meant? I didn't even know what it meant at that time. I just wanted to go fly an airplane, you know? Mm. But that vision was there then, and it's now expanded out almost 17 years from the time that Wade also came over. Because even I got hired here about the same time, he was in business development, I was just a simple pilot. But that vision was there, and it's, it's progressed. And I think it's just because Cliff, and then with, with, with Glenn, you know, alongside, let's just get this done. Let's do this, this is what he wanted. So. It's hard to believe because it's just, it's still, you could, could I have imagined 50 seat jets of Key Lime Air? No, no, it's just, you just don't think like that. You're just happy just flying what you have. I mean, when the Metroliner was the biggest thing, then that was the biggest thing, and you're just okay flying the Metroliner. But, you know, the do, you know first the Brazilian, I'll never forget it. Same thing, Cliff grabs me, the first delivery of the Brazilian, we get it here, and he goes, hey, I'm gonna show you a real airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, it's just smoother, and it's like it's just a real airplane. He says, I bet you're like, ah, frick, that's just crap. This is a man, this is an airplane. You know, that was, his, that was his thing. So he's always looking for bigger, better, faster, we, like we all are. But the Brazilian, and then the Doja, and you know, and I was kind of disconnected from the Doja just because I was still flying up here, but you know, I saw that, that scope, and then I saw the NCAA stuff get really, really, and that was a lot of big wage things, getting that NCAA developed, and how that relationship is, and the Halliburton, and Schlumberger. I just think it's it's still like anything else, like any business, it is about your relationships. It's about how you establish those relationships. However you do it, know people by a first name. Know that they're that we're there to take care of them equally as they're trying to take care of us. And I think it's just all about relationships, and this is where we're at right now. And I think the 50 seat's gonna be just, it's a springboard to so much more greater opportunities in this country that I think we probably can't even imagine what's next. So you mentioned yeah. communications, and you know one of the things I do here as director of communications is try and build systems to 
allow right. all of us to work together, talk, mm -hmm. share, sure. uh, socialize, do all the things that we should be doing. Right. Um, I built our community site. Mm -hmm. You've been here a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that as Glenn and Clift hoped it would do, it's bringing us together more and allowing us to work together more, share more? I think it's there. I think there's still, we're still dealing with some of the early challenges. I think it's just hard to get, I mean, it's, it's a little bit like trying to steer the Titanic. A lot of guys are, we all kind of get stuck in our kind of ways. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting there. Um, I think the openness is there. I like the fact that we're beginning to create some inroads with, you know, hey, somebody posts a video and likes and things like that. And we're kind of seeing, and you you kind of like, oh, that's cool. They, they saw my video, they liked that. And they saw the picture, they liked that. And that's cool. And I think that just continues to bring us together. I think it's still a work in progress. And I think we're getting there, right? I mean, I think we're still getting there and it's going to be, the newer people that come in that are really on board will kind of help support that culture because they're going to be indoctrinated from the beginning right. and not have to be the guys that go, I'm going to steer these guys this right way. You know what I'm saying? So right. I think they're going to be better to help be excited at this new opportunity and feel that community that's there. You know, so it's a process, yeah. I think. The best cases I've seen of people engaging are them asking questions mm -hmm. in that public forum right. and then all of a sudden, everybody just came together right. with the information to provide an answer. Sure, uh, I know, exactly. it's cool. especially on some of the cargo stuff, the crew cars, and some of the mm -hmm. things that, that I've done that recently. Great. Uh, that was a collaborative process of people contributing and coming together to build something for everybody. Correct. It, that to me was a big moment, a it big was. change. It was, and I think we're excited about doing that. And I think that what what took a fairly short amount of time could have taken a that could have taken six months to get that that accumulated accomplished and accumulated. And we did it what in a matter of four or five days, probably. That's right. So that was cool. It was really good to see. So you think there's anything that can stop us now? Oh, absolutely not. No, there's, we're not we're not stoppable. I think there, you know we we like I said I think the vision that's out there is even probably hard for me to fathom. But I think that uh, as long as uh, we keep working hard and keep pushing it, we, we've got this. We've got this. I mean, we're going to be bigger than I think people think we're going to be. You, you taxi by and you see, you know, two Dojets and a Metroliner sitting out there with these gorgeous colors. And you know what? That's just the beginning. So when the first 737 or 57 <laughs> or 67 oh, rolls out, it'll happen. Are you going to be wanting a seat in that? It'll absolutely. I will tell you, I had a dream. <laughs> I never told Cliff this. I had a dream about 10 years ago. On the UPS ramp, on the opposing side, I had a dream one night that there was a DC-10 painted up in key lime colors. Swear, wow. swear, I saw it in the dream. I still believe it'll happen. Wow. Well, I hope it does. Absolutely. Chad, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it as well. Thanks, DJ.